debate on the European Green Deal, how does it impact EU food and drink SMEs? Uh, this event is supported by Food Drink Europe. I'm Brian McGuire in Brussels today in the state of Washington. And you can follow the debate at hashtag EA Debates and please tweet your comments using that hashtag and our social media team will respond to there as well. And to ask questions, uh, go to the chat section which is on the right of your screen and send the questions. We already have uh, some questions coming through. So thank you to our audience, they're super engaged already today. And uh, we'll put those to the panel uh, during the course of the discussion. Now today, in the EU, there are approximately 22 million SMEs nearly 290,000 of those are food and drink manufacturers. Making sure that SMEs can fully contribute to the European transition to more sustainable food systems and thrive on their pathway will be an important factor in successfully achieving the European recovery and building Europe's resilience. But how much do we really know about the way food and drink SMEs adapt to legislation decided in Brussels? And how do they cope with new requirements and the transitional periods? Uh, what are the main challenges is also something we're going to talk about today. And some SMEs are ahead of the curve, but others uh, find the efforts uh, difficult and often go unnoticed. We'll discuss the implementation of the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy and their impact on European food and drink SMEs. And drawing on real life experiences, we'll ask how the EU can uh, develop a framework that is friendly towards SMEs while operating across the single market and also supporting sustainable business practices. Our panel today, Giacomo Martino, head of uh, unit at Food Health uh, food, uh, Retail Health and DG Grow, the European Commission. Uh, Marlene uh, Mortler, member of the European Parliament, member of the Agri Committee, and a substitute on the Envy Committee. Uh, also, Petros uh, Kokalis, uh, he is a member of the European Parliament, a uh, member of the Envy Committee, and a substitute on the Agri Committee. And Celine Kaufman, Head of Entrepreneurship, SME and uh, Tourism Division at the OECD. And Dennis O'Flynn, Director of Clonakilty Distillery in my home country of Ireland. Great to have all of you with us today. Um, to kick off, let's uh, get about 60 seconds or so of opening remarks from each of you, and then we'll get into the, the main discussion as well. Giacomo, let's, uh, let's start with you. 60 seconds, sir. Great to have you with us. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. Really relevant topic for us. Uh, the agri-food ecosystem, uh, I mean, uh, as you said already, and uh, as many others, is composed of a large majority of SMEs who indeed play a crucial role in the overall competitiveness of, uh, of this ecosystem. And uh, from the Commission side, and let me say also from the service that I represent more specifically today, we are paying a particular attention, uh, you know, not to place any additional burden on SMEs when it comes to design and, and implementation of policies, uh, and in this case, policies covering the agro-food system. Uh, we have uh, and are designing a number of interesting uh, practical initiatives and I will be more than glad uh, then in, in the following discussion to illustrate uh, some of them using, uh, mobilizing our SME support instruments uh, that are there for that purpose and very active, uh, like uh, the European Cluster Collaboration Platform, uh, the Enterprise Europe Network, and the European Resource Efficient uh, Knowledge Center. So we have, um, you know, using also not only our, I would say, uh, attention when making and preparing policy action, but also mobilizing our instruments in order to support SMEs in these uh, challenges. Thank you very much for, wow. again for inviting me. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And indeed, we'll come back to talk about some of these issues a little later on. Marlene Martler, over to you, 60 seconds or so. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. The topics uh, of food protection and food security are particularly close to my heart, especially when it comes to our European small and medium sized food producers and processors, as is the case today. They work hard every day to ensure that we can enjoy good food, but above all that, we have enough to eat and to drink. We in Europe can be proud because uh, our food is high quality, safe, affordable and known worldwide. This may sound like an obvious statement, but it is not worldwide and especially during the COVID pandemic. That is why the economic power of the entire food supply chain must be supported in the context of the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy, our small and medium sized food and drink producers matter. Why? The EU wants farming that is more organic and food that is produced regionally. The EU will further and better develop the concept of closed and regional cycles. 
food supply chains need to be reformed, especially in terms of environmental, social and economic sustainability, right and important. But the political and legal framework must be practicable and predictable. Whether, uh, whether due diligence, front of pack labeling or code of contact, to name a few examples. These or other ambitious initiatives must not lead to considerable bureaucracy. Exemptions for small and medium-sized enterprises are essential. This is how they remain stable and competitive. Our policies must be scientifically sound. Detailed impact assessment should be carried out to ensure food sovereignty and food safety in the EU. We need to promote research, innovation and investment in food and drink sector to produce more sustainable and affordable food. Finally, we need a well-functioning single market. SMEs mainly sell their products in other member states within the single market. Therefore, harmonized rules and consistent enforcement of rules are very important. Thank you very much, Malen. Uh, Petros Kokalas, over to you. Thank you, thank you, very, thank you for inviting me. I think it's important to to know that the European Green Deal is the roadmap for making uh, the European economy sustainable by turning climate and environmental challenges and social challenges into opportunities. In our case, moving towards a more uh, healthy and sustainable uh, food system. The truth is that uh, this includes uh, key policies and measures such as the Farm to Fork strategy in the new circular economy action plan, as well as the biodiversity and the soil strategies that will impact the business as usual model for the food and drink SMEs. The food and drink SMEs will need to respond to these new challenges and other ones such as uh, climate action for both mitigation and adaptation, a fair economic return in the food chain uh, and increased organic production. They will need to adapt to new stricter rules as well. However, from my point of view, there will also be tremendous opportunities for the sector towards the, this twin uh, green and digital transition that we are pushing through. One of the key issues in my mind for the SMEs on the agri-food sector in order to adapt to this new framework and develop this, uh, their businesses is to be very well informed from the very beginning and consulted with during the legislative procedures that push the new strategies forward so that they will be able to get prepared in order to identify opportunities and comply with new rules and higher environmental and social standards. So I hope we will be doing a good job in, uh, in doing that in, uh, in the next hour and a half. Excellent. Thank you, Petros. Esling Kaufman, your turn. Well, thank you very much, Brian. And uh, on my side, I would like to leave you with two key messages. The first one, obviously, is the importance of having SMEs on board for the green transition. And the second one is the need to address their specific challenges, notably their access to finance, which has become uh, even more of an issue with the COVID-19 crisis. Just on the first point, the challenge is obviously that individually SMEs may be considered low impact um, and low risk and as such be excluded from reporting and reduction schemes. However, we know that collectively they account for a significant share of companies in the food and drink sector, 99% um, of uh, companies, and of the sector environmental footprint. We know from the recent EU barometers that SMEs are stepping up their adoption of green practices, but what we can see is that they are still lagging behind the big companies in this area. And the specific challenges that they face compared to bigger companies typically relate to uh, access to information, to skills, and to finance. In particular, in terms, of the, on, in terms of financing, on resource efficiency actions, and we know, for example, that the majority of the emissions from Europe and food and drink manufacturing are associated with energy use, one of the main challenges is coping with the upfront cost of retrofitting processes and installations. And when you ask SMEs what would be helpful for their company to be more resource efficient, they actually mention grant subsidies, but also advice on funding possibilities. So we believe uh, at New City that financial institutions have a key role to play in accompanying SMEs towards uh, net zero in particular and to address their environmental footprint more generally. And that's why we've actually launched not even a month ago, a platform of, on financing SMEs for sustainability to foster knowledge sharing and identify practical financial solutions. And I'll stop here. I'm happy to come back in the debate. Yes, we will. Thank you very much, Celine. And finally, Dennis O'Flynn. Dennis. 
Hi, thanks, Brian. Uh, yeah, Dennis O'Flynn here from Clonakilty Distillery. And um, just to give you a bit of background, uh, we're in the southwest uh, coast of Ireland on the Wild Atlantic Way. Uh, we uh, built our distillery in 2018 and started producing in 2019. And I'll touch on that later on. Um, Irish whiskey must be three years old to, by law, be whiskey. So therefore, our first whiskey will be mature in 2022. And we look forward to that. Um, Ireland now in a post-Brexit world is a very significant player in the whole spirits uh, space and Ireland is the home of, of, of Irish whiskey and has enjoyed a rejuvenation uh, in the last 20 years going from uh, four active distilleries uh, 20 years ago to about 40 now and all of the new incumbents you'll appreciate are in the SME category uh, and our uh, global sales have increased by 140% so we're in a good place. Uh, looking specifically at Clonakilty, um, our plant has been designed around uh, modern technology uh, and fuel efficiency, etc. And I note uh, Celine's comments in that regard, and I might touch on them. As regards sustainability, uh, Clonakilty is part of Origin Green, which is a certification from the uh, Irish Food Board, uh, which independently audits us on uh, sustainable practices around raw materials, packaging, emissions, uh, and social sustainability. Uh, and in that regard, we uh, are looking to have uh, packaging wise 100% sustainable by the end of next year, 2022. I think it should be noted that the Irish whiskey industry is uh, fully engaged uh, with the sustainability agenda already. And we've already implemented quite a number of uh, initiatives. But as an SME, uh, we have some concerns and um, we touched on some of them already. Um, capital required, uh, even where we have government incentives, uh, borrowing from financial institutions is problematic. And particularly the treatment of uh, such loans on balance sheets, uh, because as such, it inhibits our ability to uh, borrow additional funds for probably more pressing uh, issues. Um, secondly, looking specifically at Clonakilty, because we commenced in 2019, and the baseline is 2018, uh, from a, a, an energy consumption point of view, obviously our numbers are up <laughs> on a baseline of zero, and therefore we'd be concerned about capacity restrictions. And then I suppose the third issue would be that the larger players have probably a bigger voice than we have, and we just want to make sure that the SME voice is heard. Uh, our needs are slightly different than the larger players, and I think uh, the one-size-fits-all policy could be problematic. So uh, here, to, here, looking forward to a, a, a robust discussion on all of the above. Excellent. Thank you, Dennis. Jack, well, let's come back to some of these issues uh, that Dennis just raised here as well. Now, I'm sure you will say that SMEs are listened to just as well as uh, the big players are too, but the dynamics of this uh, work differently. And as Dennis pointed out as well, the capital requirements for, for smaller companies, the balance sheet looks very different and the short term uh, needs for smaller companies um, are also different as well. How does the Commission try to balance these elements out and, and is there more that uh, can still be done uh, for, for companies like Dennis, which is exiting the startup phase, but is still to, to reach maturity in, in the market. So, you know, how do we get through this transition period? Uh, thank you. No, certainly, I think that there are uh, across the the different initiatives taken by the Commission, uh, there are um, initiatives and and tools uh, addressing the the points that uh, that uh, Dennis, for example, has has highlighted. But uh, the, there are some of them uh, taken also by by other uh, by other speakers. Uh, certainly, we are aware. And and one thing I would like to to mention up front to reassure. We are fully aware of the specificities of SMEs and, 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 and the peculiar needs. And even in the actions that uh, we are uh, you know, implementing more directly in my service, uh, we are targeting, as I said before, specific action. Now, well, I can only mention for the sake of, of timing, I can only mention uh, a series of examples. Uh, and, and, and the examples concern certainly uh, uh, you know, uh, access to finance, which seems to be the more, uh, I would say, um, the, the top uh, mention uh, element. And there we, we are, uh, a, a, among other elements, but we are uh, identifying uh, instruments that would allow an easier um, uh, borrowing and an easier access to finance to companies 
uh, when it comes to the green and digital, by the way, uh, transition, uh, by giving also to the uh, financial institution a number of, uh, uh, I would say, more than guidelines, but uh, uh, indications uh, on, uh, you know, on the grounds and criteria to, to, uh, to identify the needs uh, for SMEs. On other actions, and then maybe I'll, I'll stop here my, my, with my second example, and it's the one I know better because it's closer to my activities. Well, we have uh, a direct, I would say, uh, interaction with uh, uh, networks, SME support networks in particular, that are there really to guide on the spot, so close to each SMEs in their territory, uh, you know, the, uh, the transition. And just to mention one in the Enterprise Europe Network, which is a network of, you know, uh, support organizations um, that are really, uh, you know, they speak the language of these SMEs in each country that are very present in the territory. We have building and we are even improving the role of what we call sustainability advisors. Uh, so these are persons where the companies can address free of charge, by the way, and be, uh, you know, be guided in their path uh, towards uh, uh, more uh, sustainable uh, okay. actions that respond to our policy priorities. Thank you. Thanks. Celine, thank you for that, uh, Giacomo. Celine, you know, it's easy enough to say we have the support, but uh, for smaller companies as well, they simply don't have the time and the resources to uh, expand on all, all these different fronts at the same time compared to, to larger organizations. How do you see this uh, from, from uh, OECD's uh, perspective? You know, is the, the Commission's policy in the right direction? Are the support mechanisms realistic? Or is it still a, a disproportionate um, benefit to, to larger companies? Because that addresses elements of competitiveness as well in, in the single market. Celine. Yeah, thank you very much, Brian, for the question. Um, you know, compared to other jurisdictions that we're looking at at the OECD, the, the, the EU institutions, and in particular the European Commission, has a long tradition of uh, including an SME perspective in its climate and environmental policies. And you can, uh, you know, see it uh, back into uh, 2014 with the Green Action Plan for SMEs, uh, the circular, circular economy package, uh, the EIB Climate Bank Roadmap, and even the 2020 SME strategy uh, had a very strong sustainability uh, dimension. So I would have to say that compared to other OECD jurisdictions, the EU and the Commission in particular has been at the forefront of embedding uh, an SME perspective into, uh, in, into the programs. On our side, what we see as the big uh, risk um, going forward and, you know, coming out, you know, hopefully of the crisis is um, actually related to their uh, capacity to finance the investment needs uh, that turning greener may require. SMEs and in particular retail, wholesale and accommodation and food services have been among the most affected sectors by the pandemic across you know, all countries. And in many cases, uh, the SMEs are still struggling for their survival and with rising debt levels. And in the coming months and years, as governments and you know, across OECD countries are actually um, phasing out some of the support, very strong support measures that they've established during the crisis, there is a real risk of uh, insolvency risk, and there's a real risk of bankruptcies, you know, across uh, SMEs. And beyond that, there is actually a risk that because of that debt level, SMEs cannot undertake the needed investment required for retrofitting their installations or going greener in their practices. Just to give you an idea, there is an OECD research that shows that because of the debt level following the COVID-19 outbreak, higher um, this level of debt can actually reduce investment ratios by as much as two percentage points, which is quite high. And the last aspect on that is also that we've seen that during the crisis, financial diversification, so the capacity of SMEs to tap into different uh, financial instruments has drastically reduced compared to uh, the pre-pandemic phase, where we could see, you know, a trend towards more financial diversification, including for SMEs. Now there is a risk that we revert back on this uh, 
on, on this uh, good trend. So I would say, you know, today the big challenge will be there. Thank you. Uh, Petros, you spoke about challenges, turning challenges into opportunities, uh, you said in your opening remarks. Uh, is the challenge too big for SMEs? Is uh, this moment of uh, pitching towards uh, sustainability as we exit the uh, uh, COVID crisis, if we're going to exit it by the looks of it, uh, is this too much for SMEs to handle? Is the, are the funding instruments sufficient? Is the, the system well enough geared towards uh, this transition, Petros? Well, Brian, you will pardon me, but I think that at this moment of uh, momentous challenge that we're facing in terms of the climate crisis, which of course is uh, the mother of all crises, even compared to the COVID crisis, and it's not uh, a crisis that can be dealt with a vaccine or anything like that. Um, uh, so I think that it's more important to focus on the opportunities that are given uh, in front of us. And uh, the very, um, uh, the very, shift in the focus of the common agricultural policy as well that is breaking out the, from this silo of uh, only of addressing only farmers and um, and farm companies and breaking out to uh, embrace the whole uh, food chain to, uh, towards uh, uh, consumers uh, health consu uh, healthy establishing a sustainable uh, system of food that is healthy for consumers and it is within the planetary boundaries should be seen as a tremendous uh, opportunity now of course uh, there is uh, there are great inefficiencies in this food chain at the moment. Most glaring of all is that uh, very few farms are classified as SMEs. So the line between an SME food and drink uh, producer and the farm and a farm is is not exactly very clear. So yes, it will be more difficult for SMEs. Yes, what Celine and and uh, and Giacomo talked about are barriers and they are disadvantaged towards uh, the very large companies companies i mean if you look at the if you look at the data you have about uh, uh, 99 percent of the food of the of the companies are smes but the turnover of the one percent uh, that are large companies is 50 percent and we're talking about a, a 1.1 trillion market here so yes it will be much more difficult for the smes but um, I think that this is the time to to uh, focus on the opportunities, not on, not so much on the challenges. Thank you, thank you, uh, Marlene. You spoke about uh, making things practical and predictable, and in this uh, time of immense uncertainty on, on all fronts, SMEs clearly need to find a way to make their business practical and predictable if they're going to invest and if they're going to get the the capital needs uh, to permit that investment as well. How do we use uh, this moment transition to make the system more practical, more predictable, and uh, has the Commission's policy uh, structure gone some way towards that, or is, is it doing enough? Um, I think the Farm to uh, Fork report of the European Parliament highlights that while new sustainable uh, business models are enormous opportunities for SMEs, um, several initiatives under the strategy could lead to the creation of substantial red tape. We ask for better regulation tools for impact assessments. We ask to use the InvestEU fund to facilitate access to finance for SMEs and to offer tailored solutions to help SMEs to develop new skills and uh, business models. The EP, the European Parliament, asked for more EU funding for research and innovation, especially for SMEs and smallholders, as key drivers in accelerating the transition to a more sustainable, productive, diversified, local, healthy and inclusive European food system. The European Parliament urges the Commission and the Member States to reduce the administrative burden on small and medium-sized uh, part participants in the food chain. And we need measures such as streamlining registration processes, making permit and license and approvals more efficient. Our small food and drink producers must get their products to market as quickly and easily as possible. A well-functioning uh, single market is one of the enablers of the European green transition, especially for SME. Therefore, 
harmonized rules and consistent enforcement of rules is very important. The EP is raising awareness on the issue of non-tariff barriers and asking the Commission to intervene timely when those appear. Thank you, Marlene. Dennis, in terms of the single market and the opportunities and challenges faced by SMEs, yeah, do you feel that the single market is, is fair for, for your sector, that uh, you, you, you're not facing non-tariff barriers and uh, entry into to other European markets in particular? Uh, is, is that framework at least in your favour? I think the, 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 the market itself is, is, is open and is in our favour in that regard. And, and from a, as an export-led industry and an export-led uh, business, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't see that as, 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 the, as, as where the, the issues arise. Um, if I might, Brian, I'd let you just touch on a couple of the, of, of the points made by the other speakers. I mean, guidelines to financial institutions are all very well. But that doesn't really uh, impose any any compunction on them, and and the difficulty, as long as borrowing remains a balance sheet item, for example, uh, financial institutions will continue to uh, look at that as 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 uh, you know on their ledgers, and 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 that is sort of uh, it, it it constrains us. And the second question you may you raised there was around um, the, is this sustainability challenge too big for SMEs? I think SMEs are absolutely our front and centre of this because almost by definition, uh, we are local. We source locally, we distribute locally. If I look at our, our, our raw materials, all our barley is sourced within 50, 15 kilometres of, of where we are. Uh, we're based on the family farm down in, 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 in Clonakilty. So we're front and centre. We're more than happy to get involved. But to give you two very simple examples, Biogas versus LPG. If we were to move across from LPG to biogas, uh, there's an eight cent penalty there. That's 35,000 to Clonakilty Distillery. Now, that may not sound a lot, but it's huge to us. Equally, we've just installed a boiler in, in Clonakilty, which could have been about 10% more efficient, but it would have cost us about 20K more. So that's the kind of number. We're talking about 20Ks and 30Ks and 50Ks, not millions but they would all make the difference to us. So I think it's looking at it on a more granular level. Thank you. Uh, Giacomo, exactly on this point as well, you know, what can the Commission do? What can the, the current instruments do to uh, balance out these uh, disparities where you know, clearly companies like uh, Dennis uh, has the opportunity to use more fuel efficient, more carbon efficient uh, technologies, but they simply can't afford them. And you know, as, as short term as the, the, the commissioner or the policymakers uh, may see that, uh, the, the, the reality is that companies like Dennis, SMEs, they simply can't afford it. So how do we, how do we get around that? How do you break that, that, uh, that situation? Well, first of all, let, let me say something that uh, I think we shall never forget and keep, I would say, in the back of our minds. Eh? There are limits to what uh, uh, the, the European Union uh, from Brussels, I would say, can, uh, can do, and in particular the European Commission. Eh? The, it's difficult to imagine, with very few exceptions that we, we can mention, for, which are mainly concentrated in, 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 in uh, innovative, uh, very innovative uh, actions, and for very innovative companies, it's a bit difficult that uh, from Brussels we give directly financial support. So our interventions are very much linked to, uh, you know, the, the, the infrastructure, are very much linked to uh, interacting with the national or local authorities when it comes to setting uh, priorities and setting uh, support, including financial support uh, uh, to SMEs through the structural funds, so, for example, the use of regional funds, uh, which are decided, let me remind, also locally. Uh, so, therefore, our role is very much and largely, uh, you know, in, in terms of, uh, of making sure that uh, the, the, the right uh, connection between the different actions, being them at, at EU level, national level, local level, uh, uh, are there. In that respect, uh, I think that uh, we have also to think, uh, you know, the European Commission as uh, a facilitator rather than a source of immediate uh, financial support. 
apart from certain conditions that uh, we have mentioned in particular under uh, the research and innovation programs uh, um, or uh, under under uh, investeu but there as well this is done through uh, financial uh, actors thank you Thanks. Uh, we have a question for Selena, she's going to come to in just a moment, but just to say to our audience, please send in your questions now and uh, we'll begin putting those to uh, our panel in just a moment or two as well. Uh, Petros, you know, the farm to fork strategy uh, has a, a lot of opportunities uh, for uh, Europe to, to re-engineer its, uh, its uh, food sovereignty issues in terms of uh, modernizing uh, the food sector uh, as well. Uh, you know, the, the Green Deal layered into that makes that, that challenge more complex, but also uh, raises the quality of the food produce that uh, Europeans will ultimately uh, consume uh, as well. You know, f for your, your country and the SMEs, how do they interpret these challenges? Do they really see them as opportunities, like you say, or, uh, or, or uh, is this just another requirement, another piece of red tape, like uh, Marlene says, that has to be uh, whittled down to the basics, where the, the basic requirements are, are put on SMEs and not overburdened? Well, I think that uh, many, in many ways, the, the both the farmers and the SMEs are way ahead of us in this curve because uh, they are out on their fields and it is their fields that are being ravaged by uh, climate change and extreme weather events. They are the fields that are being flooded. They are the fields that are being torn up apart by tornadoes, which we have never seen before. And they understand that they need to adapt uh, their uh, their means of production to stay to stay within the business. Uh, uh, so I think they will be moving much faster than uh, than we think. Now, on the farm to fork specifically, um, uh, the, the the main targets are are uh, uh, targeted towards uh, the farmers and and the field. The the use and the the, and the risk of use of chemical pesticides is to be reduced by fifty percent. The nutrient losses should be uh, reduced by fifty percent. The use of fertilizers must be at least 20% down and the sales of antibiotics 20% down. And very importantly, we should be turning uh, about 25% of the total land into organic production. So these are very, very big targets and are big changes. And they, can, they will obviously uh, have a, a very um, substantial health effect on the population because we must not forget that now with the COVID that uh, food and diet in general is the main cause of non-communicable diseases in the uh, in the European Union, so um, yes, this is uh, this is like uh, Executive Vice President Timmerman says, this is going to be bloody hard. But um, the way that we managed our business so far, there is no other way to do it. And what's important right now is to move forward with uh, a just transition that takes care and provides tools and finance for everybody to make the transition uh, in a fair way. Thank you. Uh, Giacomo said earlier the Commission can't do everything. Uh, Vice President Timmerman says it's bloody hard, but Mario uh, Draghi had said uh, whatever it takes. Maybe this is a moment to bring uh, Mario back on board at some point as well. Thank you for that. Uh, just to pick up on a couple of those points, climate uh, change, Petros in particular, uh, you know, this is about building a resilience into our food supply system as well, because you know, a lot of this investment is not just about making better food, but about uh, reducing uh, the risk to our, our food uh, supply as well. Uh, and uh, you know, do, do SMEs see it this way? Do, do they, you, uh, they feel the, the, the temperatures rising, they see the tornadoes as well, but uh, are they conscious that they need to invest to survive as well in, in this, uh, not just market, but climate? Petros? Well, uh, I think that uh, both uh, Mr. Draghi and Giacomo are right. I mean, we must do whatever it takes. And yes, there are very big limits to what the EU can use. And Dennis is right in saying that the you know, guidelines to financial institutions don't mean much because you know, we still live in this world of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, super unregulated market uh, idea that the market will fix anything. And this is definitely not the case in, uh, in uh, this kind of emergency that we are living through. We should not forget that it is this parliament that has declared the climate emergency. And uh, what we have seen with the pandemic, that when we understand the crisis as a crisis, when we see that public health is being uh, threatened, then governments can and have taken uh, extreme what seemed extreme measures to protect public health. They can direct uh, the market, they can, they can invest in uh, public facilities and in infrastructure, 
and they should be doing uh, that again right now because uh, uh, it, it's not uh, the case that we can, uh, you know, um, drop all the the cost of the of the transition on the shoulders of SMEs and and most importantly consumers. Thank you. Marlene, just a quick point on this uh, as well. You know, the Parliament has, has called this a climate emergency. You know, are, are we looking at uh, a farm-to-fork strategy, the Green Deal, through the eyes of emergencies or through the eyes of, of the markets? And, you know, it, the market clearly can't resolve all these issues. So is there a balancing act here or should we be focused on the emergency situation above all things? Marlene. Um, I, I think we should do both to see it through the eyes of the market, uh, but also through the eyes of the emergency. But uh, we know that we alone, we alone in Europe, we can't um, um, solve this problem. It is a worldwide problem and we have to uh, solve it uh, worldwide. But, but we are uh, the first to run. Yes, we are. <laughs> Thank you, Marlene. Okay, I have some questions from our audience. The first one for Celine from Angelina. And uh, she says, a big proportion of small, medium food and drink companies in Greece base their goods and services on tradition, heritage, and traditional recipes. How will the traditional way of cooking and traditional re recipes be affected by the new Green Deal and farm-to-fork strategy? Celine. Are you sure it's a question for me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can you can try, or That's you can pass very... on entirely to you. Um, I think it's better to pass that over. Um, okay, do you mind if I pick up on one point that was made uh, before in the debate, in particular on the importance of the better regulation agenda? Yes, because please, uh, uh, th this is to us a very critical uh, part of the discussion, um, ensuring that indeed regulation and the measures that are you know taken and at on not to burden some on, on SMEs. What, what we find as well is that, um, you know, despite the challenges, it is very important that SMEs are not always exempted from uh, regulatory requirements because this defeats uh, the objective of the regulation in the first place and removes the incentive to change behavior. So, of course, there is a need for more granular, you know, uh, policy making, more SME friendly regulation, more SME friendly standardization as well. So that both at the technical level, but also at policy making level, uh, there is a consideration of SMEs, but not only of SMEs per se, but of different populations of SMEs, because it's not the same uh, to be, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, a manufacturing uh, installation or to be a retail uh, company. Uh, but having said that, uh, it is important that um, SMEs can be brought on board uh, to these uh, regulatory requirements and that they have the accompanying measures to be able to actually comply with these regulatory requirements. Because one of the key hurdles and challenge that we see is that we, we don't have a lot of information on SME's footprint, on what, you know, not only their environmental footprint, but what they do to actually um, go greener, uh, because very often they don't do, they are not part of these reporting requirements. You know, sometimes they are incentivized to do it and there's strong incentives so that they, they can actually start this reporting mechanism. But until we have a good uh, database and also SMEs know what, what they should be doing, it will be very difficult to actually act with a very precise um, actions on, on the SME. So just a point on that, because that debate on what kind of measures and whether to exempt or not uh, SMEs, uh, in our view, is a, is a very important one. Okay, thank you. Jack, well, you want to reply? I want to come back to Dennis after that as well. Jack. Yeah, well, uh, coming back to, to the question, but uh, I would also actually try to, to bring also a contribution to, to the question that was raised on, on local food and, and the impact, but by in fact, by uh, linking to what Celine said, which in my opinion is very essential, and I'm saying that, uh, you know, with the help of somebody who is also involved in preparing or assessing uh, legislation, uh, but, but uh, I don't want to be necessarily politically correct, I think a very big challenge is definitely represented by finding the right balance from an SME perspective to this uh, whole range 
of measures that are proposed, being it at, uh, from Brussels, being it also at, at national or, or local level, that they shall be uh, manageable. And this is why, I mean, the, the member of the European Parliament were, were referring also to impact assessments, of course. This is a key element because the risk, and, and I say that, as I said, from inside the Commission as well, is that uh, we have a cumulative effect of legislation on the individual SME that is hard uh, to manage. So we have to pay, as regulators, I think a particular attention. Uh, impact assessment uh, are one tool, uh, but certainly uh, not the only one, uh, on the effect of these different measures. And this is why, once again, I would like to uh, underline that it's important also that we use all our supporting tools uh, to SMEs in order to help them in this uh, sustainability transition. Thank you. Uh, Dennis, question here from Greta, maybe just a bit more explanation, and maybe you can help with this. Uh, Greta asks, would, she would be interested if you could elaborate how uh, the needs of SMEs differ to large, larger players. This keeps being mentioned, but it's not entirely uh, clear to me. Uh, this, uh, this could be an example of uh, the political bubble that everybody knows uh, the, the difference in terms of policy side. But on, on the ground, what does it mean in terms of, of your business and those, those around you? What's the difference between SMEs affected by policy and uh, the larger players? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, well, I mean, getting back, and it ties in a couple of the other com comments. I mean, in the sustainability piece, uh, we are based on a family farm, so we're very well uh, versed on, 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 on sustainability and where we are. So looking at an SME, yeah, we're, we're smaller in size, we're smaller in scale. Um, and in that regard, I, I, I pointed to two uh, items there, which would have cost, in real terms, small amounts of money, uh, you know, 20,000, 50,000, which a larger organization wouldn't uh, have to concern themselves with. Equally, the technologies that can be used by a larger organization tend to be a more expensive technology. And uh, you know, to try and retrofit them into a smaller business uh, very often doesn't work. Uh, larger organizations, broadly scalable, and size does matter in the context of, 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 of uh, overall efficiency. So I think, you know, if you're looking at, I'm sure there's a definition, but if you're looking at a, an enterprise employing less than 50, 60 people, maybe less than 100 people, uh, one location, uh, based out of a locality as we are here in Clonakilty, uh, that's what we mean by, uh, by, by, by an SME. And, you know, I, 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 looking at some of the other, other comments that have been made, I don't think SMEs are looking for handouts. What we're looking for is a, a, a fair playing pitch. In other words, that we're quite happy to invest, but we don't want investment in the green agenda, which we're absolutely committed to, to inhibit our ability to invest in our business as it grows. And I think it's the challenge of getting those two uh, elements right that is, is 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 where we're at i mean looking at everybody on the presentation uh today uh, we're all first world of course there's an obligation on the first world to drive this to lead this to start spending ahead of the curve and the smes are quite happy to do their bit in that but and it's not like we're looking for handouts but we're looking to be part of the game and we need to just have particularly the financial side of it uh looked at uh, and the other one just as, as as an aside we're on a family farm uh, it makes no sense to me in the context of Irish agriculture, where we're probably one of the more efficient uh, producers to, uh, you know, divest of some of our farm uh, and farming practices uh, and, uh, and allow that to be replaced, uh, replaced by less efficient. So I think a little bit of thought into, you know, how we balance this as we go through, because I think it's a journey we have to go through. Petros, just on this, uh, the, the elements of, of uh, farming techniques as well, for example, you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all package here either because you know, Ireland has been highlighted in terms of its, uh, the opportunity there uh, for uh, soil uh, health as well. You know, because of certain types of agriculture practices, the, the, the reduction of fertilizers, reduction of phosphates in particular, uh, Ireland is particularly uh, advantageous for that. So you know, we're, how do, is the Green Deal, is the Farm to Fork strategy sufficiently sensitive to different needs in different regions across Europe, or is the expectation that everybody does the same thing? I think it is absolutely suited for uh, this kind of diversification and looking into the local conditions and, you know, uh, binding back to the local food uh, idea. I think it's the, the right time to produce 
food that we know where it comes from, that has a story where it comes from. And um, uh, uh, so uh, I think it's very important to recognize that uh, one of the emblematic uh, common policies of the European Union, which is the common agricultural policy, the oldest and most expensive, or the biggest item on the budget, uh, has been revised for the seventh, I think, time now. And for the first time, it allows for uh, much greater local flexibility, national flexibility. And we are at this point now where we're expecting, uh, where the Commission is actually expecting back the uh, national strategic plans that will specifically come from the member states and they will uh, have to build on their specific uh, uh, strengths and, and, and weaknesses and, and heal their weaknesses. So I think it's a very good time to be uh, about local and, um, and the far to fork really gives uh, an advantage to, uh, I think, smaller producers. Thank you. Um, well, then there's a question here with Giacomo, but I think uh, maybe you could have a go at it as well. Let me know what you think. And the question is from Zoe uh, Zira from Public Affairs Consultancy. She says, uh, the change at the company level is, of course, vital, but there is a need to change the demand by consumers towards more sustainable and healthier options. In your opinion, what should be done to encourage this? Is the answer more education or regulation, uh, tax labeling, uh, banning, etc.? Marlene? Um, for me, it's very important more education uh, and, and more prevention for uh, um, our youth, uh, for adults. Um, that's the one. Uh, the other is I, I wanted to repeat and uh, to continue that uh, the single market principles should be embedded throughout the strategy, yet uh, the possible extension of mandatory origin indication to certain products does not appear to respect these principles. Um, member states uh, must be discouraged from undermining the single market through protectionism, which negatively affect European and global trading. We need to ensure fairness for all including a review on buying power across the food supply chain and a redefinition of consumer welfare to reflect sustainability goals rather than the lowest possible price. The use resilience and recovery uh, remains best secured through a fully functional single market the promotion of rules-based international trade and mutually beneficial trade agreements and partnerships um, combined with support measures when needed. Excellent. I want to follow up exactly on this uh, rules-based international uh, structure as well. Uh, Dennis, you know, do, you, do you think it's fair that the European market should be open to uh, products and uh, coming in, agriculture products, food products coming into uh, Europe, which don't adhere to the same standards, which don't have the same uh, cost requirements behind them as well, uh, effectively causing a form of dumping in the European market as well. You, should you, in the whiskey sector, expect that the quality of the products being sold in the European market should be compliant with uh, the same standards that you're held to? Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's a, a very political question, that one. Uh, yeah, no, of, of course, uh, you know, I mean, we've got to protect standards and the whole farm to fork thing is ensuring that there is traceability and sustainability right, right across the piece. And I did refer earlier in an earlier remark about, uh, you know, those people who are, as it were, best in class should not be penalised uh, and therefore allow the, the, the floor for be, be taken under them. Uh, looking specifically at the uh, whiskey industry, um, we are um, geographically protected. We have GIs for Irish whiskey, so you can only actually produce uh, Irish whiskey in Ireland, um, uh, on the island of Ireland. So in that regard, uh, we are protected in the same way as the Scotch whiskey is, is equally pr protected. But uh, no, I think that the standards of food, food quality, food delivery uh, has to be at an appropriate level right across the piece. Now, in that regard, yes, uh, other parts of the world may have uh, greater difficulties, but I think in that regard, we've got to look at this as a global issue rather than as a local issue. And I think sometimes local can get in the way. I mean, this is a huge issue. We're all aware of, 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 of you know, 
Brazil and and and, and the carbon sink that the, the, the rainforest is, you know, that this has got to be treated as a global issue. Food standards have got to be treated as a global issue. And no, I would not be a supporter of, 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 of dumping uh, across the European Union. Thank you. As we all know, uh, Irish whiskey is spelled with an E, and perhaps um, we can find a way to have that included uh, as the definition of whiskey in, in all future trade agreements. Uh, Giacomo, uh, this on the food quality and uh, dumping issues as well, in terms of uh, farm to fork strategy, Green Deal, what's in there that can help protect uh, European uh, food producers, particularly SMEs, uh, from uh, lower, less, less climate sensitive food production methods? Yeah, well, very big question, as also Dennis uh, said, and uh, I also buy fully on what he said concerning uh, it should be addressed at a global level, because I think the very difficult challenge, and to be honest, I don't have a magic solution to that, is to, uh, to, 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 to strike the balance between the fact that, uh, yes, we want uh, as much as possible uh, you know, the products uh, that, that, that uh, enter into the EU market uh, uh, to, to, uh, to have our same level of, uh, of, of quality and, and standards. Uh, on the other, we want to preserve uh, whenever this, uh, you know, this applies, uh, uh, the global supply chains uh, that are, uh, I would say, key to the competitiveness of, of the industry. So, um, yeah, it's, it's very difficult there. One example that I can give you is the current debate now on the uh, deforestation uh, measures that uh, are also part uh, of the overall, uh, you know, of, of the overall uh, Green Deal, uh, one of the specific measures accompanying them. Uh, and we are um, putting a lot of attention in, in really striking the, the right balance between the fact that Yes, we want uh, products to take account of, uh, you know, uh, deforestation challenges. But at the same time, we don't want to impose to companies and in particular, of course, to SMEs to be able to, 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 to track back and to report uh, on uh, how really, uh, you know, the, the, their supply uh, chain of, uh, of primary products or, uh, you know, of components uh, has been uh, has been produced. Sometimes this proves to be really impossible or very burdensome to perform. So there again, I think it's a matter for the legislator of, of finding really the very the very appropriate balance. And we are doing that in close collaboration and in consultation with stakeholders, uh, including of course with uh, with SMEs. Thank you. Petros, uh, protecting the, the supply chain uh, in, in Europe, uh, protecting from uh, poor practices globally as well. Is the Parliament sensitive to this? Should this be a requirement in future trade agreements? Uh, how do you see it? Well, I also buy in the idea of Dennis that this should be dealt in a global way. It's, it is a global issue. And I think that we must use both our, we must lead both by example and also by practice. Um, sometimes we forget that Europe is actually an exporter of food. It's a net exporter of food. It's the biggest exporter of food in the, on the planet. So in terms of, uh, of importing and how we use our muscle, to our, muscle our purchasing power, uh, to, um, to, to make sure that we stand up to our principle. I think it's extremely important to look also into labor, labor conditions as well as biodiversity uh, losses. And I think this should be reflected in all our trade agreements and uh, as well as uh, in the future uh, reiterations of the CBAM regulation. Um, there is no question that uh, we have been exporting our emissions in the past 20 years. We have so-called decoupled our emissions from our GDP. But at the same time, we have deindustrialized and we are importing a material that is producing emissions in other parts of the world. So I think that uh, we must really uh, step up to the plate here and, uh, and preach what we uh, and do what we preach. When it comes to doing what we preach, will we be uh, tough minded when it comes to, to dealing with uh, those countries that do sell into the European uh, market as well. If we look back to what happened with TTIP as well, it was chlorinated chicken that brought the whole thing down by and large because the public was sensitized to this particular concept. Uh, it did, even if the merits weren't exactly well understood at times. Is this the kind of, uh, do, you, do you anticipate public uh, uh, disapproval of trade agreements based on uh, a softer approach to import of uh, food 
uh, which is not held to the same standard. And by the same uh, approach you talked about leadership, you know, Europe uh, has to show the leadership, but if a supply chain uh, is uh, uh, where the, the head, for example, Coca-Cola decides that all of the, its suppliers need to be sustainable, then the whole supply chain changes. And you're talking about our market strength in Europe as well. Will the global supply chain change if Europe is clear-minded uh, and firm uh, when it comes to dealing with open markets and, and trade deals? Well, I think we have an opportunity which, uh, to, to, uh, to exercise this leadership. Uh, we are the biggest, one of the biggest markets in the world. And so long as we keep uh, our goals uh, clear and, and concise and enforceable, I think we, should, uh, we will uh, contribute to this uh, struggle uh, mightily. Uh, I think that um, uh, the big uh, multinationals have a tremendous role to play and uh, they would much prefer to go by European standards. Um, and 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 you know deploy them elsewhere in the global supply chain and um, uh, uh, the same goes for uh, emissions as well. So yes, I think that uh, we see that in the sustainable finance the, uh, debate where uh, we should have our uh, European Union uh, sustainable finance regulations or should we comply with international standards? No, I think that we should put our standards and try to bring the global standards up to par. Thank you. Just a couple of shout outs to uh, people who have commented here. Adele Moroni uh, from Wales, who has written something in Wales, which I'm not even going to dare try and pronounce, uh, from the uh, from drink sector. Also, uh, George uh, Stacco, he is says, glad to be here. Uh, George in uh, SME lending uh, sector as well. Uh, I like this approach to uh, making the connections here as well. Thank you for that, George. Um, question here from uh, Jorge. Uh, Riabo, uh, when defining unilaterally, unilaterally rules and standards which are not respecting multilateral rules and therefore EU obligations, do you think this is a sensible request to the rest of the world? We've touched on some of that already. In particular, uh, is uh, there uh, if these rules are not based on principles and scientific evidence? Marlene, just uh, any further comment on that uh, for Jorge? That uh, uh, that we need. To, you talked about science, following the science earlier as well. Uh, establishing our principles. Uh, do we need to do this more firmly, uh, as uh, 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 Petro said? Marlene? Um, I can make it short. I, I agree to Petro. <laughs> I agree to Petro. <laughs> Very well. Thank you for that. There's your answer, Jorge. Let me see. We have another couple of questions as well. And uh, this one for Giacomo, and uh, it's from uh, Jacques. He says, uh, will there eventually be a truly systemic methodology adopted to manage the various irreductible and complex dimensions of the Green Deal? If there's something that the Commission is good at, it's a truly systemic methodology. Giacomo, uh, how, how close do you think we can get to doing that with the Green Deal? Well, the, the, the Green Deal uh, is certainly composed of a very large number of uh, measures and each of them uh, with uh, its own complexity. So we have instruments in place uh, in the Commission. I, we mentioned already and other mentioned a uh, number of them, including, you know, uh, impact assessment, uh, public consultation, but also, um, you know, platforms, uh, multi-stakeholder platforms and internal inter-service instruments by which we uh, manage or we try at least uh, to manage this complexity and to come up with a coherent set of uh, um, you know of proposals and then not let's not forget the following layer of uh, you know of control on that uh, we have uh, two representatives here for example of the european parliament and when listening to them i'm assured that they will pay a lot of attention to to the aspects uh, that that were mentioned so yeah I think uh, overall in the European Union and, and when it comes to policy making, uh, we, we are making a lot, a lot of uh, efforts to, and uh, we are dedicating a lot of attention to that. Thank you. I just want a couple more questions here uh, on regulation, then I want to talk a bit more finance uh, as well with uh, Celine and uh, Dennis. Uh, Nico asks, um, sustainable public procurement of food is an important tool. Improvements were made in 2014 with SMEs and, public, and procurement, but public procurement does not allow discrimination between local and non-local producers. Any plans to change the regulatory framework to advance local food production? Let's ask our MEPs first. Petros. 
I am. Uh, I definitely agree with Nico. I'm not aware of any specific uh, upcoming legislation to uh, fix that glitch. But uh, as uh, I think that Giacomo very well pointed out, this is a parliament and a commission that are very much up to their feet, and they are doing their best and fastest to to adapt to this uh, to this transition. Uh, I can't agree more with the idea that public procurement should support local food. But I do see the, the problem of the single market. So uh, I think that it's a good point. Much as we have uh, breached the taboo of, uh, the, uh, of customs and borders uh, and uh, through the CBAM regulation, I think that it's a good time to look hard and, uh, and sincerely to many of our long health uh, practices and fix them where they need to be fixed. Thank you. Marlene, uh, Jack, anything to add to that? No, yes, if I, I may, I mean, yes, sorry, Marlene. Marlene. First and Giacomo, go ahead. Marlene. No, I, I agree to Petros. I don't, I don't read it. Thank you, Giacomo. No, just to add that, yes, the, this is a very important point, and uh, uh, I think it's no secret that uh, we are currently considering how to uh, you know, improve, uh, and I'm not referring only to the agro-food sector, but uh, for example, I'm following also health, uh, the health ecosystem, as we call it, uh, how public procurement can contribute uh, by integrating, uh, you know, uh, greener and uh, in general more sustainable criteria uh, when it comes to, you know, to, to their, uh, to, uh, to the process and then for, for public authorities in particular, for example, to, to, to buy or require products. So th this is a challenge we are very much aware of, and it's something that has to be carried out uh, really very with high attention. Thank you. There's a question from uh, Sarah, University of uh, Göttingen. Uh, how do other developments at EU level, like the planned proposal of a due diligence uh, legislation, as well as the regulations on deforestation, free supply chains, come into play? Uh, those are additional regulations SMEs need to take into account. Marlene, any comments on that? Yes, um, it is very actually. Yesterday it was um, at, um, um, on the agenda of the committee uh, in DEVI committee. And uh, I can say that with the recently presented regulation on minimizing the risk of deforestation and forest degradation, the EU wants to oblige companies for the first time to trace their supply chains and precisely determine the place of origin of, of products. I therefore very much welcome uh, the fact that the EU is making its contribution to global deforestation, especially in view of the Paris climate targets and uh, the goals of the climate conference in uh, Glasgow. We must ensure that the instruments chosen for the protection of forests are effective without at the same time creating excessive administrative burdens for companies on the other side. Our European companies need legal certainty first, especially small and medium-sized enterprises. Thank you. Uh, Petros, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I think that as a general comment, um, I think that it's crucial that we recognize that uh, this is a very difficult situation where we are at and we are moving towards more regulation. We are where we are be partly because of extreme deregulation. So now we're looking at more regulation. And the, the problem here is how do we make sure that we do not, that we have better regulation, more regulation, more data, more information, and at the same time, we don't penalize the SMEs as opposed to larger companies. How do we maintain our competitive sustainability uh, during this process? So I think that there needs to be a very large, a very strong uh, development, a very strong uh, 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 increase in the ability of the member states to go next to the SMEs and give them this information. I can start saying about maybe 10 or 15 strategies that affect the food system from the biodiversity strategy, organic action plan strategy, soil strategy, and we cannot expect the SMEs to have the departments that will be able to respond to this. This is something that we, as a public, as as the states, should be doing and offering to the company. 
Thank you. Just say to our audience, if you want to add a question, please do it now. We're coming up about uh, 10 minutes uh, to go. I want to talk to Celine and uh, Dennis a little bit more on this about the financing. Uh, Celine, you know, the idea that uh, sustainability of debt, which you raised earlier, uh, is it, this could become an increasing issue as well uh, as uh, if we, we face another financial crisis uh, too, and that, we, that would immediately affect uh, the capacity of, of smaller companies to continue with any innovation and transition towards uh, greener, more sustainable uh, food supply as well. What concerns you most about the sustainability of debt and what do you think can be done about it which isn't already on the table? Celine. Sorry, one second. I, th I think you're on mute. Can you unmute, please? I'm sorry about that. There we go. Yeah, it's indeed, fine, no it's, it's, it's a concern that uh, we see the level of debt um, has risen um, tremendously uh, in the SME population. We haven't seen, you know, a wall of bankruptcies that we could have expected during the crisis, but it's because of the massive support that governments have been providing to SMEs. And there's a risk now with the massive support being withdrawn or phased out or, you know, being changed from liquidity support to, to other kind of support that some of the SMEs can't survive. And those that can support the level of debts that they have, they may not be equipped for the level of investment that, uh, that we are talking about. There's one thing, you know, that was mentioned in the discussion, which is indeed SMEs will have in the future either directly or indirectly through their suppliers and the financial institutions requirements to actually abide um, to more regulations in the area of sustainability, even if they are not, you know, affected directly, we'll come back to them indirectly. There's an issue of information, access to information, and there's a lot that is being done by countries and the European Commission to actually provide that information, you know, through one-stop shop and provide technical assistance and provide self-assessment tools, advisory support for SME. We see that as being a very welcome development because SMEs need to know. But once they know, there will be a need for them to transition to these greener practices and to retrofit some of their, you know, installations and uh, and, and activities. And, and there, you know, if... Um, if the, the financial support remains the same, the financial instrument remains the traditional bank loan, there, there, is, there is a risk that the level of debt will not allow those companies to undertake that uh, financial, you know, uh, that, that investment. And so, again, uh, some of the solutions are, you know, to be discussed with financial institutions. They are also in the uh, diversification of the financial instruments uh, for, for companies. So it's it's a discussion that needs to take place now and a priority that needs to be what taken do you up think, uh, now. What do you think should be done? Because at its heart, that's not, you, you, you're asking financial institutions to deal with non-market issues, these are these are global climate issues. These are issues to do with public health. Um, you know, and these this level of compliance is being demanded from essentially non-financial institutions as well. So, uh, you know, how if you're going to put these, this kind of burden on uh, on smaller companies, how do you support those smaller companies if you're demanding uh, this uh, compliance? Well, there's a demand and there's a supply, you know, side uh, to to the to the financing uh, aspect. On the demand side, uh, SMEs, SMEs are not always aware of the financial opportunities to green their their practices and their activities. So there's a huge effort to put into. Uh, providing SMEs the range of opportunities, uh, information on the range of opportunities that they have, because there are many, you know, initiatives that are taking place at government level, uh, at EU level, uh, through different uh, initiatives that SMEs are not necessarily aware of. There's need for support on, you know, these reporting requirements that the financial institutions will need as well uh, to help, you know, uh, companies. Uh, you know, comply with those reporting requirements. There's also new products that can probably be uh, put on the market on the supply side uh, and work by financial institutions to reflect on the kind of help they can provide either to specific SMEs or to grouping and clusters of SMEs.
Thank you for this, Dennis. Dennis, you, do you work with other uh, companies and groups or clusters to try and, and get some sort of scale out of uh, resolving these, these compliance issues as well? You, how does it feel where you're sitting uh, to be able to manage uh, uh, what's going to be an increasingly regulated, increasingly compliance-driven uh, food supply chain system? Yeah, I, I, I think there are going to be difficulties, no doubt. Uh, I would suggest that there is a lack of joined up thinking, to be quite honest with you. Um, I'm just listening there to, to, to uh, some of the comments and, and uh, you know, the, the price of, of, of uh, the Climate Action Plan in Ireland alone is put at 125 billion, which is just a, a massive number. Addition regulation is not what's needed. But if I were to take it on a very simple level, uh, you know, uh, we in the whiskey industry have been asked to, to desist from spreading byproducts on, on, on agricultural land, as we did in the past. There's also sort of nitrate directives, and, and we, we buy all of that. The solution then is something like um, anaerobic digestion, which works and it'll pay back. But the capital cost for me is still 300,000, which I don't have. So we got to join up the dots because there are actions being taken on one side that have an implication on the other side and the whole supply chain is not being joined in, 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 in a full ring. And it, regulation is not what's needed here. I think you've got a willing uh, participant in the SMEs. I don't think we're pushing back in any manner or form. Uh, what we're looking for is support in any initiatives, any green initiatives that are coming through. We're more than happy to, 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 to get on board, but uh, it, it cash flow as you'll appreciate in any small business is king. And we referred to COVID there. I mean, cash uh, has been a huge issue for us in the last 18 months, uh, 24 months, and is likely to continue for the next number of months. So I think there is a conversation that needs to be had between uh, the powers that be, whether they be in Europe and otherwise, and the banking system as to how this can be dealt with that will allow uh, us to just proceed. Uh, and and uh, you know, there's no there's low financial risk here. Okay, so just like uh, Irish whiskey requires three years to mature, perhaps European policy requires uh, three years uh, to mature before it should be allowed in the open market as well. This, we're going to go to our, our closing remarks uh, now as well. Uh, so uh, let's uh, start with Giacomo and uh, your key message uh, to take away today. Thanks, um, thanks, uh, Brian. Well, uh, my, my key message is, is that really we have to listen a lot to, uh, to SMEs, uh, the, the, the path uh, towards, uh, you know, the um, more sustainability uh, for our society and, and for our businesses is not an easy one. And the role as, um, uh, as a legislator, uh, as a regulator, uh, together with, with public authority is, of course, to strike uh, the right balance uh, between the, the, the ambitions and the fair ambitions that we have and the costs that have to be borne by, uh, by, by the businesses, knowing that it is also a big opportunities as it has been very well highlighted before. So that will be, I would say, my main uh, takeaway. Thanks. Thank you, thank you Giacomo. Marlene. Uh, thank you, Brian. I think our SMEs um, are unbeatable <laughs> if uh, uh, we allow <laughs> to do their work. Uh, I think on the other side, the COVID-19 pandemic has made us realize how important such everyday things are for us, namely the availability of food, beverages, and medical uh, supplies. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our farmers and food producers for their day-to-day -day work and resilience in times of crisis. Building on this, I look, uh, forward to working with the Commission and the Council and with all partners in the food chain to prevent food crisis and preserve food sovereignty in Europe. That is not normal. In this context, I would also like to appeal to the Commission to take small and medium-sized enterprises with them on the road to the Green Deal and not to overburden them with even more bureaucracy. Thank you. Well, and thank you. Petros. Well, uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, speak to Dennis and uh, to tell him that uh, they should hang in on because the point he's making about the banking system that needs to respond 
to the to the speed of change is very valid and it's coming and you are also right brian that it takes some time for the european policy to come through but from the files that we're seeing regarding um what is bankable and what is not uh, we are in the middle of a, a, a tremendous regulatory transformation of the banking system and the financial system and this should be coming soon so uh, again like I, I said in the beginning i think that this is a better time to focus on the opportunities and uh, that will give us hope to face the tremendous challenges excellent uh, a, a blended whiskey not a, a single malt from from the policy process thank you and celine over to you well i, I think on my side what i would uh, strengthen is uh, put the focus on is uh, that the attention needs to remain focused on supporting smes undertake that transition because what we're seeing now and i'm not uh, talking necessarily at the EU level, but also at the EU members level, is that uh, compared to the rescue package and the emergency measures that were strongly focused on SMEs, the recovery packages that are that governments are, you know, kind of putting forward are much less focused on on SMEs, and they are. Uh, in particular, much less focused on SMEs when it comes to uh, the green aspect of this recovery uh, package. So just to give you uh, an example, um, the, the measures that are you know, focused on uh, SME uh, policies are probably around 4% in terms of number and 2% in terms of funding in the recovery package. And that compares to 17% in terms of number of policies and 25% in terms of uh, public funding invested uh, into SME policy as part of the rescue package. So th there is a risk that the focus on uh, SMEs uh, disappears over the longer run. Thank you, Celine. Last word, Dennis. Uh, Celine, you're, 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 you're depressing me, Celine. <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, SMEs, I think we said it, uh, represent about 90% of, 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 of the business within Europe. And by definition, we're local. And by definition, we get sustainability and we get the agenda. Uh, we're very much on board. Um, we're not looking for handouts. But what we are looking for is support so that we can get the finance that we require to transition across. And that's really where we're coming from. And uh, finally, from an SME perspective, not one size fits all. The bigger organizations have the wherewithal to do with it. But I think I hope, as I've illustrated, you know, even small uh, parcels of, of, of cash flow can make a huge difference. Uh, and we're very much on board. Thank you. Thanks to all of you, to Giacomo, Marlene, Petro, Celine and Dennis for an excellent discussion today. It was uh, very fruitful. Uh, to Food Drink Europe for their support uh, today. We appreciate that a lot. And to uh, our team here in the studio, uh, Bonya, Elisa, Tamara, Zoran and Malta. This wouldn't have happened uh, without them as well. I'm Brian McGuire. Wish you a good day.